I train in medicine and in public health, and uh, as uh, Rob said, I, I lead research on dietary public health. Um, I'm particularly interested in population-level interventions to change diet, uh, and my research program focuses on the food system, diet, and health. Um, so, just to kick off, um, uh, I thought it important maybe just to make it clear what I mean by a population intervention. Uh, population intervention is one delivered to a whole population, irrespective of baseline risk for the condition of interest. So, for example, if we want to change diet, putting labels on the front of food packages is something that applies to the whole population. Similarly, mandating wearing of seatbelts. Conversely, high-risk interventions are ones delivered to individuals, sometimes groups, delivered according to their level of risk for the condition of interest. So, for example, we might screen for risky alcohol consumption and then intervene at the individual level with brief interventions to try and reduce that consumption. Now, both of these are important, but they both have a different part to play uh, in public health. Um, so, yeah, if we do a high-risk intervention, we intervene at the top of the risk distribution here. Uh, and in a population intervention, what we try and do is we shift the, the whole population distribution to the left. Um, and I guess most of you know this. And these are the ideas that have been were put forward by the late Geoffrey Rose uh, in his book, The Strategy of Preventive Medicine. Um, so the important thing about population interventions is that they have very wide reach. And because of that, even though often they have quite small effect sizes, they have big impact. So, for example, if you want to prevent strokes, um, reducing by a small amount the salt that we all eat um, can lead to a large number of uh, uh, a reduction in the number of strokes. Whereas intervening at, at, uh, in people at high risk of stroke, so for example, treating hypertension in a smaller number of people, um, results in a smaller number of reduced strokes. The other important thing about um, population interventions is that they seem to be better at maintaining health equity or reducing health inequalities. So uh, on this uh, intervention plane from our paper in PLOS Med in 2016, I uh, mapped out a range of interventions to change diet. And on the y-axis, the, the vertical axis, is population versus high-risk interventions. And on the x-axis is the extent to which interventions make demands on the individual, the extent to which an individual needs to engage with the intervention for it to work. So, for example, if we take population interventions along the bottom here, on the right-hand side is front of pack nutrition labelling. So that requires, so it applies to everyone, it's there in the shops, it's on every food product, um, but it requires individuals to be literate, to be numerate, to be able to make those rational choices about which foods to choose, to have the resources available to choose healthier foods which are often more expensive and so on. Conversely, on the left-hand side, if we take something like putting flour in um, putting folic acid in flour to um, uh, prevent neural tube defects, as you have in the US, um, but and I think we're going to have in the UK sometime soon. I can see the Chief Scientific Officer of the Department of Health nodding there. Um, uh, if you do that, nobody has to change anything. You just carry on eating flour. Nothing changes. So it doesn't make the same demands on the individual. And to give an illustration of the effect of this, this is um, some data on water fluoridation in the UK. So. Uh, on the vertical axis is uh, de mean decayed missing and filled teeth in five-year-olds uh, in small areas. So each point on this graph is a small area. And they're distributed according to socioeconomic position on the x-axis uh, using uh, Townsend deprivation score. So you can see that in non-fluoridated areas, there's quite a steep socioeconomic gradient, gradient in decayed missing and filled teeth. If we then look at artificially fluoridated areas, not only does this reduce... <coughs> excuse me. Um, overall decayed missing and filled teeth, but it also reduces the socioeconomic gradient. So it has a positive fe effect on health equity. And again, on this graph, in addition, to naturally fluoridated areas. These tend to have slightly higher levels of fluoride, so it has an even bigger impact. What you'll notice is that the gradient doesn't disappear altogether, and that's because, of course, there are other factors leading to decayed missing and filled teeth, such as eating confectionery, drinking sugary drinks, and toothbrushing. Now, as has been said this morning, um, Health behaviours take place in complex uh, environments or contexts. Um, and uh, this, this is a diagram that I use in teaching that just is really just to illustrate eating within the household and family context, which takes place within uh, a kind of social and economic con context within which, uh, as consumers, we purchase food. And that sits within a much wider uh, macroeconomic environment within which the food system exists. So on the far left-hand side of this, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we have the different bits of the food system. The food system is very complex. It has lots of elements to it. But together they work to deliver food 
uh, to retail environments where we're exposed to it. Um, importantly, within those different retail environments, whether they're online or in the high street, in institutions, whether it's grocery or whether it's um, ready-to-eat food, marketing is one of the key ways in which um, we're encouraged to buy particular types of food. Um, so these are all the different kind of environmental cues that lead us to eat the particular diet that we eat. Um, and I, I guess importantly here, almost all of us are utterly dependent on a commercial food system. So commerce is at the heart of, of the, the kind of drivers that lead to what we eat, and it's really important to remember that. We are, I think, really fortunate in the UK to have now a plan for obesity, a childhood obesity plan. And um, the second version of this, which came out last June, focuses in particular on regulatory measures at a population level, which are primarily aimed at changing the commercial food system in ways that will lead to a healthier food offer for the public. And this is, I think, a terrific move forward. So these include things like calorie labelling, as I've mentioned already, um, restrictions on uh, in-store promotions in retailing for, uh, in relation to either placement of foods or the price, so some of the things that Therese was talking about this morning. Uh, restrictions of TV or online advertising of unhealthy foods. Uh, fiscal measures such as our soft drinks industry levy and uh, other kinds of restrictions on sales. And there is the potential for there to be further industry levies as well if the soft drinks levy works and if voluntary reformulation, which industry is being encouraged to do currently, doesn't work. So I'm just going to give, I have such short time, I'm just going to give one example of some research we've been doing, uh, which is looking at how some of these measures work and how they pan out. So <clears throat> I guess all of you are aware of um, confectionery and other junk food at checkouts in supermarkets and indeed in some non-food stores as well. And we know that the public doesn't like this, in particular mothers or parents with children don't like this uh, because it leads to pester power and impulsive purchases and so on. Um, government is interested in whether or not they can regulate uh, this and so we did some research to see how uh, effective a supermarket's own policies have been in this area. We did three things. We did desk-based research to find out what policies the nine major supermarkets in the UK have. We then did a survey of 69 supermarkets uh, across the east of England um, <coughs> to get a, a feel for how they're adhering to their policies and what kinds of foods were available at checkouts in stores that had and didn't have policies. And then the third thing we did was to do a longitudinal analysis using interrupted time series um, method um, looking at household purchases of the kinds of foods that are at checkouts, and for this we use data from a commercial supplier, a market research company that works for the food industry, Cantor World Panel. So they have a panel of 30,000 people who use one of these little gadgets um, to scan all of their shopping uh, once a week, and uh, on average people stay in the panel about four years. So uh, this is a timeline that shows the nine supermarkets in rows on the left. Um, and we, we looked at data up between 2013 and 2017. The purple spots are the points at which a policy was introduced by each supermarket. And you'll see that there are six supermarkets that introduced a policy during that time period. <coughs> we analysed data for one year before to one year after, so we looked at monthly time points for our time series. And then we had three supermarkets, two of which um, had policies throughout that period, so they had pre-existing policies, and one of which had no policy throughout that period. And we used those three as controls. So this is just some uh, plots um, showing the interrupted time series analysis. I'm not going to present the statistics. Um, so in blue, you have the comparator. We picked, a, and in red, you have the intervention supermarket. So these are the six supermarkets that introduced policies during that period. Uh, we chose a comparator based on the best fit of the pre-intervention trend. And in some cases, we used more than one supermarket as a comparator. Um, and then we modelled the post-intervention trend in the intervention supermarket, so that's the dotted red line, and then we looked at what actually happened, so that's the observed. So we compared the expected to the observed, and you'll see in each case the observed was lower than the expected, so this is, uh, this is measuring purchases of checkout foods. Um, and because all of the supermarkets introduced their policies at different times, we were interested to look at the overall effect, so we put these together into a meta-analysis. What we found was uh, four weeks post-intervention, there was a 17% reduction in sales of these foods, and at one year, a 15% reduction in these foods. So quite a sustained effect. And in marketing terms, this is a very big effect size. 
<laughs> okay, so the last point I wanted to make about population interventions or, or generating evidence to inform population interventions is that there are kind of two modes of generating evidence. And <clears throat> in working in this field, you, you kind of need to be aware of both modes and what kinds of evidence to generate in each mode. So the top row on this, the top line of the diagram, is very familiar, I guess, to many of you. It's kind of the, the paradigm of evidence-based medicine where we develop interventions as researchers, we pilot them, and test them for feasibility. We then do definitive randomized controlled trials, which generates evidence. We try and synthesize all the evidence together, put all the trials together, and we hope that then leads to policy action. And we have a National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence in the UK, which does that evidence synthesis job and decides what kinds of treatments and policies we should have. Conversely, the other um, mode uh, relates to um, population level policies, um, many of which are introduced without evidence of effectiveness. Um, and with, as researchers, we're then in a situation where we have to work out whether or not we can evaluate the effectiveness of in intervention. So we do things, do things like evaluability assessment. Um, and if we can, a retrospective evaluation, if we're very lucky, a prospective evaluation, such as we've been able to do with the soft drinks industry level. The other important thing is that um, observational evidence of need and of the potential for interventions is really critical to informing these kinds of interventions. So the kind of modelling work that was done on sugar taxes in advance has been proved really important to uh, inform those kinds of interventions. So just uh, last slide, just some key principles for Im impactful population behaviour change. Focus on the things that are important, where there's a high population burden of disease. Act on upstream levers at a population level, aiming to try and reset the system. So, for example, changing the overall supply of healthy food. Choosing low agency interventions, things that people don't have to think about. Um, and then there's a list of research challenges. Thanks very much. <laughs>